So folks, very welcome, um, a warm welcome on a cold day. Um, so we're going to get started. Um, I've actually got the poll um, up and running, I believe. And thank you. I can see that your um, answers are coming in here. That's really useful. Thank you. We also ran the poll on um, Twitter overnight and um, the results from Twitter were 50% were feeling um, uh, depressed, 25% um, having issues with, bo with bowel issues. Okay, I think that gives you a good, um, good enough um, idea, ladies, for, your, for the purposes of what you need, right? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm going to end the polling there. It was just a quick um, look-see. Thank you. Thanks for answering the questions, everybody. So uh, just a couple of quick things, if you haven't um, seen the slide. Um, we will send out a recording of this um, and you'll receive that in the coming week and uh, use the chat box at the bottom of the screen to ask your questions throughout the presentation. Um, we will wait till the end of both presentations to give the uh, responses and um, join our forum uh, so that if we don't get all the answers to your questions, we can, um, Gita will be joining us on the forum afterwards. So we are running a competition um, this month as well, and it's an opportunity to win um, a C pen, a reader pen, which is um, a really good piece of kit, good piece of technology. And it's been um, kindly donated to us uh, by a private donor. And we thought we'd um, run a competition and you can share your ideas on how to be um, stay well and healthy at this um, current time. It'll be um, uh, available on the forum, so you have to join the forum. So today we'll give you a bit of a head start and entrance must be 18 or over to join. And it's running uh, until the end of December. So you've got an opportunity here to um, win an exciting piece of um, technology that will help uh, with reading. And we've also got um, another, an offer for members. Uh, so this is um, from a lady who runs a, a, a health and wellbeing um, company. And she's offering a discount to our members. So if you um, use the code and you'll get a, a discount there um, as described on the, on the screen. And we'll share these slides as well. So. You don't need to be writing frantically. This will all be available to you after the event. So I'm not going to uh, stay talking anymore. I'm going to just hand over to our lovely presenters who I'm delighted um, to have here with us today. I know they've put in extra efforts to collaborate uh, to make sure that the content that they're going to bring today is relevant for people with dyslexia and our audience in general. So huge thank you to um, Gita and Anita for being here to share their, um, their experience with us. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves and I'm going to hand straight over to Anita to start her presentation. And Anita, I'll give you a little wave when you're um, nearing time. So don't worry about keeping um, to the time. Okay. So I'll stop sharing here and uh, it should be over to you. Okay, let's see if it works. Share. Very good. Let me just make it big. Great. Well, um, I should probably say afternoon everybody as it's just gone 12 o'clock and the sun is shining in two tin. I don't know what it's like where you are. Um, so my name is Anita Chakraborty and I'm a registered naturopath. So that means I'm a qualified herbalist and a qualified nutritionist and a qualified iridologist. And um, I did my naturopathy degree in Sydney 
um, qualified in 2008 and started practice in 2009 in Sydney. And then I moved back here, as you can tell, I'm from London. I moved back here four years ago and set up my business from scratch in, in London. So, um, yeah, I'm also a qualified astrologer and a shamanic healer as well. But I'm here today just to talk about the actual biological impacts of stress and uh, natural solutions um, in terms of herbal medicine and nutritional supplements. Um, I was going to do an audio of this and put it on my website so that, you know, if you're doing the washing up one day or cooking something healthy, you can listen to it rather than these slides, which are a bit, um, yeah. Okay, so biological impacts of stress and natural solutions. So, um, just to set a little bit of a background, there was a study done in 2018 by um, YouGov, and it was part of the Mental Health Foundation. And they had nearly 5,000 people respond to their survey on mental health. And it was the largest known study of stress levels in the UK. And in 2018, of those 4,600 respondents, 74% of them said they've felt so stressed in that year that they have felt overwhelmed or unable to cope with life. So stress is a very big problem in, in, in the UK and probably globally, especially this year with the pandemic and economic impacts and health impacts. Um, but if we go back to who's the person that actually started building a theory of stress and how it affects the body, that was a man called Hans Selye. And in 1935, he was the first person to actually scientifically do analysis to say, how does the body respond to stress and especially prolonged stress? So what he did, he imposed some different physical stressors on rats. And afterwards, when he examined the rats, he found that it, regardless of the actual stressor put on the rat, the same physical result occurred. So they had shrunken adrenal glands, they had shrunken lymphatic organs, and they had bleeding gastric ulcers. So Hans Selye ended up establishing what he called the general adaptation syndrome. And he said, look, stress in a short burst is actually a positive thing for the body because adrenaline makes you alert. It makes your heart beat faster. It gets you to breathe deeper. Cortisol helps you access uh, glucose, which is energy for your physical body and also the brain. So in short bursts, stress is really good. You feel alert, you feel on it. However, when it's uncontrolled and when it's prolonged, that's when the benefits of stress get eroded and stress actually becomes damaging to the body. And there are three different stages of stress. You've got the alarm stage, which is that initial stage where you get the adrenaline, you get the cortisol, you get the rapid heartbeat, deep breathing, palpitations, your pupils dilate, yeah, so you can see better. Then the next stage is resistance. So that's when your body's starting to get used to adrenaline and cortisol, and yeah, you're kind of used to that stressor. And the final stage of the stages of stress is fatigue. So that's when your lymph nodes have been shrunken, your adrenals are shrunken, uh, you've got low cortisol, you've got low adrenaline, and that's a situation where you're struggling to get out of bed, and then you're reaching for the coffee, reaching for the sugar to get you through the day. Um, so yeah, they're the three stages of stress. So um, it's the sympathetic nervous system that is that fight or flight um, system in the body where it does prepare you from, you know, for running away from that wolf, for example, you know, in, uh, well, there are, there are wolves currently in the world, not just prehistoric times. Um, so yeah, the sympathetic nervous system will, you know, speak to the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and also the adrenal cortex, which is, sits on the kidney and say, right, produce adrenaline, produce noradrenaline, produce cortisol. We need to, you know, access glucose quickly, and we need that person to be able to respond quickly to an external stressor and while that response is happening the parasympathetic nervous system which is responsible for relaxation 
the digestion, the sleep, that gets suppressed. Because when you've got a wolf coming at you, you're not going to have a muffin and have a little nap. Yeah, you don't need to digest. You don't need to rest. You need to run from that wolf. So these two systems are opposing each other during a stressor. Right, now, in terms of some physical impacts, when you're stress-free, in the morning your cortisol is high, okay, and then during the day it starts to get lower, 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 and then when you go to sleep it's at, at its lowest generally. But what happens, and cortisol in, in a normal distribution and normal amount in a day, um, it's actually a benefit, beneficial hormone. So it's anti-inflammatory in a normal range, and uh, it's actually beneficial for, for your immune system, yeah? So in under normal daily occurrences where everything's going good, cortisol is actually a benefit to you. Same with adrenaline, yeah? But it's only when these two are activated over a long time that they can cause damage, yeah? And that is due to prolonged stress. So one of the issues with cortisol and adrenaline being, you know, prolonged in the body over months um, is that it impacts the um, pancreas and it impacts insulin and insulin resistance it will increase yeah because glucose is being accessed by the body quickly because you're feeling stressed you've got all these deadlines and you've got kids and you've got you know stuff to do so you're kind of constantly under stress and pressure so you're you know, cortisol is going, I need glucose, I need glucose, the brain needs glucose, give me glucose, yeah? So your body is getting flooded with glucose and adrenaline, yeah, which is trying to access, um, you know, keep your heart beating and keep you alert and keep you able to deal with that stress. Um, but over time, all that cortisol and all that adrenaline will, will or may lead to diabetes because the pancreas, the beta cells in the pancreas produce insulin and insulin is there to regulate blood sugar and you know the pancreas starts to kind of get a bit tired yeah so that can lead to diabetes and uh there's also a metabolic impact of prolonged stress because cortisol makes you crave more starchy foods more sugary foods more fatty foods so you end up reaching for, you know, donuts and pies and pastries rather than having some nice, healthy fruit and veg. Yeah, so you get physical weight gain. And then, unfortunately, cortisol likes you to put weight around your belly because belly fat or visceral fat, as we call it, visceral fat is easily accessed for energy rather than fat on your arms, you know, bingo wings or double chin. That's not as easily accessed for um the brain so yeah you deposit belly fat and that belly fat is actually inflammatory so it's going to cause lots of other health issues going down this road um but yeah basically prolonged stress can cause diabetes and it can also cause weight gain yeah because when you're stressed you're not really wanting to chew a salad are you, you probably just want to shove donuts in your face right immune impacts so high cortisol also affects all the different white blood cells such as lymphocytes eosinophils which are part of your immune system because cortisol will dampen that down in prolonged stress remember i said earlier short stress it protects the immune system but prolonged stress cortisol is really kind of annihilating those white blood cells and over time you can get autoimmune conditions basically because your immune system has been so dampened down by cortisol that your body your immune system gets disrupted and it doesn't know what is the attacker that's attacking me and what is my body so that's how autoimmune conditions can develop because that's when the body's innate immune system can't recognize this is an attacker i need to annihilate it uh, this is anita i need to protect her i can't tell the difference between the two now because cortisol has just been nailing me for months because i've been stressed so yeah ulcerative colitis rheumatoid arthritis multiple sclerosis hashimoto's which affects the thyroid these are all conditions that can be developed in people that are under prolonged stress now i also mentioned about adrenaline and how it affects um heartbeat blood pressure um 
contractility of the heart and in short time, short period of stress, that is fine. But in a long term, prolonged stress situation, that constriction of the blood vessels and the high blood pressure that you get with the adrenaline wanting you to run from that wall, that can lead to um, atherosclerosis, which is basically plaque buildup in the blood vessels, yeah, the uh, arteries and the veins. And obviously you get high blood pressure and then that can lead to heart disease. So yeah, there are cardiovascular impacts for stress. So um, the poll mentioned um, GIT issues, 25% of respondents mentioned that they get gut issues when they're stressed. So a factor in that is, as I mentioned earlier, you know, fight or flight, that's the sympathetic nervous system. That's when you're kind of, you know, wanting to run from the wolf. And the parasympathetic nervous system, when you're stressed, which is all about digestion and rest and sleep, that gets shut down, that gets suppressed because you don't need to, you know, eat a muffin while you're running from a wolf and have a nap. So what happens is a stressed out, adrenaline filled body has got inflamed digestive mucosa, has got imbalances in the pH of your stomach, because if you remember from school, in biology, you know, enzymes are catalysts that, you know, do things and they have to be within a specific pH range. So when you're stressed, the pH of your stomach alters. So the enzymes to break down protein and carbohydrate and fat are not at the right pH. So right from the get go, you're kind of going to cause problems lower down the digestive tract from your pH reading correct. And yeah, look, ulcers, yeah. Hans Selye in 1935, when he examined the rats that were put under lots of stress, they all had bleeding gastric ulcers. So ulcers are something that can happen in people that undergo prolonged stress. And uh, people with things like ulcerative colitis, um, Crohn's and irritable bowel syndrome, they find when they manage their stress better that the, their gut symptoms tend to die down. Hormone imbalances. So high cortisol affects estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, thyroid hormone, and yeah, it can impact fertility, it can impact menopause, and if, if you're not in that range of wanting to have a baby or in menopause, just a normal woman having her period, you know, you've probably experienced it yourself when you're really stressed at work, you get a period, it's really painful, yeah? That's because inflammation is part of the prolonged stress uh, manifestation, yeah, by the dampening down of the immune system, inflammation then take over. And people find when they're not stressed and they have a period, it's it's all fine. Um, the poll that um, was done by Dyslexia London said that 50% of respondents actually found that stress made them feel depressed. And uh, yeah, look, because of, and I'm talking about adrenaline and cortisol a lot, but adrenaline and cortisol. Over time, you know, you get shrunken adrenals, which leads to burnout. There's a correlation with cortisol and adrenaline and serotonin. Serotonin is the happy neurotransmitter that improves your mood. And when you've got low adrenaline, low cortisol, you end up with low serotonin. So depression is common. Um, GABA is the calming neurotransmitter. It's GABA aminobutyric acid, and that tends to be lower after prolonged stress so that's when you get more anxious so um yeah there are insomnia you know unfortunately i mentioned earlier yeah cortisol distribution during the day when you're stressed and your adrenals are not working properly what happens is your cortisol distribution is really low in the morning so you're like struggling to get up and then by lunchtime it gets a bit better and then in the afternoon, you have another dip. That's why you have your coffee and you have your biscuits to get a bit of sugar. And then you get home from work or you stop work as we were in a, you know, a lockdown. Uh, and then like, you know, nine, 10 o'clock at night when you should be going to bed, you feel really alert and, oh, I'm really like, this is the best I've felt all day. That's cortisol disruption. And that can happen in people with adrenal fatigue. So yeah, um, cortisol and adrenaline prolonged over time will affect sleep and will affect mood by causing anxiety and depression. And uh, yeah, it will cause fatigue and adrenal burnout. Right now, solutions. So licorice. Licorice is a great herb for people that have got low cortisol, so adrenal exhaustion. But I did kind of debate whether I should put it in the slide or not, because it's one of these funny herbs that you really need to know what you're doing before you give it to someone. 
because there's so many comorbidities that people have that you should not give licorice. Yeah, so people that are on steroids, steroids should not have licorice. People with high blood pressure shouldn't have licorice. People with liver or kidney disease shouldn't have licorice. However, it is a great herb for um, helping people that have got low cortisol and low adrenaline just kind of get their adrenals more restored. Um, Korean ginseng, there's lots of studies in China, Japan, Russia, Korea. Um, they love their ginsengs in that part of the world. And um, it's been used traditionally in those countries for hundreds of years as a tonic. And it's also very good for physical endurance. It's good for mental focus and it's good for energy. It's good for well-being. It's good for performance. And um, there was a clinical trial in the American Journal of Nutrition that um, looked at, um, sorry, there was a review in the American Journal of Nutrition that looked at lots of clinical trials. And it found that ginseng root seems to increase muscular strength and aerobic work capacity if 200 milligrams is used over a two month period. Um, so that's something that's beneficial. But again, you've got to be careful. You can't give Korean ginseng to people that have got diabetes and if they're on metformin, because it can impact the way they metabolize um, drugs for in insulin. So again, it's better to see qualified people like myself and Gita about taking any of these kind of herbs because we know about herb drug interactions. Um, Siberian ginseng, that's a really good herb because it's, we call it trophy restorative. So that means Siberian ginseng knows when you're low in you know, adrenaline and cortisol and it can help boost that. But if you're, you've got high levels of adrenaline and cortisol, it can reduce it. So it's very balancing for stress. And um, we call it, it's an adaptogenic herb. Yeah, so it just helps your body cope with stress better. It's also an immune modulator, so it's good for the immune system. And um, yeah, that's something that I do use with clients quite often with stress. Right, Rhodiola rosacea, that's a, um, a lovely herb that's also good for stress. And there was a study done in 2000 on 56 healthy doctors that were on night duty. And uh, they were given the herb over three periods, lasting two weeks each. So they were given Rhodiola rosacea. And at the end of the trial, they found that the doctors on night duty who had been given Rhodiola rather than placebo, those doctors had less fatigue during stressful situations, and they, they were more mentally alert and able to concentrate even on night duty. Um, and other trials involving rhodiola rosacea has been shown to increase physical fitness and reduce fatigue, yeah? So it makes you um, feel less tired. It's also good for the memory, and it's also an antidepressant. And like with a lot of these things, you know, you do need to know about how to prescribe and herb drug interaction, because if you're on any antidepressant or anti-anxiety medication, you shouldn't be taking rhodiola. Yeah? So everything that I'm giving you now is kind of, you know, information education, but I'm not giving clinical advice. Yeah. Right, withania, withania subnifera. Um, that's an Indian herb that I'm sure Gita will know lots about. And uh, in the Journal of Medicine in 2019, they had a, a two month clinical trial published in, the, in that journal. And it specifically used withania subnifera on 60 adults. They got split into two different groups. The 30 were given withania and 30 weren't. And uh, there was a reduction in um, stress and depression and mort morning cortisol in the withania group compared, compared to placebo. So withania has been used for hundreds of years in India for, for stress and as a tonic. Now moving on to nutrients. So magnesium, it's, a, it's, a, it's an element that is used in lots of energy biochemical reactions. So you need it to, to produce energy in the body. And it's also needed for blood sugar regulation and glucose regulation. And magnesium also relaxes the smooth muscle tissue, such as blood vessels and veins, yeah, which all get tightened with high blood pressure and with stress. And it also helps relax the muscles, yeah? So if you take magnesium at night, it can help you have a better night's sleep if you suffer from insomnia. Um, it's best taken as magnesium citrate because that makes it more bioavailable. You tend to absorb it better. Vitamin C, you know, everyone knows vitamin C is good for the immune system, good for colds. But um, there was a study published in 2001 on ultra marathon runners. 
and it found that vitamin C helped to reduce adrenaline in them, helped reduce cortisol and was anti-inflammatory um, during the stress of being an ultra marathon runner. So it's not just about immune system, it's also about the stress response. Um, vitamin B is good for bi all biochemical processes in the body and we get depleted in different B vitamins when we're stressed. So, you know, it helps reduce um, osteoporosis, it helps with um, making red blood cells to give you energy and uh, helps clear some you know nasty things like homocysteine that cause chronic health issues so b vitamins are good as well and i'm going to finish with bark flowers i love bark flowers because you could be on a million different pharmaceutical drugs and you can still take these so they're flower essences and the um, elm is really good if you feel overwhelmed when you've got a lot on your to-do list and you just feel like a startled rabbit White chestnut is really good when you've got a busy mind that you're going through all this stuff that you're going to do and it escalates and snowballs and then you can't think straight. Mimulus is good for specific anxieties, like I'm giving a presentation to Dyslexia London, I'm very scared, you know, or I'm going to get on a flight, I'm very scared. And olive is good for exhaustion, where you're so tired that you could cry. And acrimony is good for people that outwardly look really happy. But at home, they, the, their stressors lead them to use recreational drugs, alcohol, and yeah, even food to make themselves feel better. So that's the end of my talk. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thanks, Anisha. We go straight over to you, Geisha. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, really wonderful. Thank you, Barbara, for inviting me to talk today. Um, and thank you, Anita, for that really wonderful scientific background to stress and um, a lot of the interesting herbs that we, we both use in clinic. Um, I'm not going to cover um, anything what Anita's covered, so there won't be any overlap because everything she has described regarding stress is very, very valid. Um, I'm actually an Ayurvedic practitioner. Um, it is my passion, it's my purpose. I've been practicing for 12 years after studying for five at Middlesex University um, as a degree and a master's program. And part of that was six months in India, where in India, Ayurveda is really practiced as a uh, full medical system. And it's really wonderful to see how um, intensely um, and Ayurveda is used for chronic and acute conditions and surgical procedures. So it's fascinating. Now I uh, run a clinic, clinical practice in London, Fulham, Victoria. So if you're interested in making an appointment, you're welcome to connect with me via my website, which is on the last slide. And I do run workshops and I'm also running a lot of um, retreats now, online retreats. So people can do retreats with me virtually, which is great. And if you are interested in reading a little bit about Ayurveda, I have published a book two years ago, which is available. And ironically, it's called Ayurveda. So it's got a lot of background in there about the system um, that I'm going to discuss with you today and talking about how we can stay in balance that's personalized to us and a lot about digestive health, which, which really is linked to stress and stress management because our gut brain is um, connected by the enteric nervous system. So we definitely want to start thinking about what we can do in our day to day that can help us to reduce stress, which is what I really want to focus on. So you have some uh, some really beautiful nuggets to take away and apply. So what is Ayurveda? So Ayurveda, Ayur means life and Veda means the science. So Ayurveda translates as the science of life. Now, for many of you, it may be new, but it's been around for 5000 years, actually. And it is actually the sister science of yoga. So if you think about yoga philosophy, yoga principles, there's a lot of mirroring and synchronicity across the board with um, Ayurveda and yoga. So together, they are really here to help us achieve better health, better well-being and happiness. And, and ultimately, the whole purpose of our life is to feel liberated, to feel um, ecstatic and feel in joy. So they are inseparable sciences. Now, Western medicine, you know, really focuses on disease management. And so for acute conditions and emergency situations, this is brilliant. But we often ignore a lot of our signs and symptoms that are there. And Ayurveda is really beautiful in the sense that we are really looking at prevention as the cure. So before we get to the point of having a health issue, 
we can start to establish the imbalances that are coming up. And some of them are very obvious. For example, you know, if we have um, gas and bloating, um, maybe we have acid reflux, maybe we're getting dry skin or we're not sleeping well. All of these little things that we experience in life that doesn't feel normal are signs and symptoms for us in Ayurveda. But what happens is we ignore them because we wouldn't go to the doctor necessarily for those health issues. But then cumulatively over time, these things can accumulate and then we'll get, in, get ourselves into um, health conditions. So there are no quick fixes when it comes to Ayurveda. It is a lifestyle. Ultimately, this is what we want to remember. So it's a 5,000 year old system of medicine. And, you know, it's where spirituality meets science. And that's, that's what was most attractive for me when I first embarked on the journey of Ayurveda. It's about looking at ourselves in a very holistic way. We are a complete ecosystem. So our health issues are not just pertaining to physicality. It's about mental health. It's about emotional health. It's very much about our spiritual well-being as well. So we want to think about all aspects of who we are and address the root cause of where our stress is, where our health issues are coming from. Maybe we're having issues in relationships. This can be a massive trigger for stress and health issues. Maybe it's our environment maybe it's work-related stresses. So we really want to start thinking about where the stresses are actually coming from and work at that level, treat the root, not just the symptoms. Yes, if we're having you know, certain issues, we can take um, herbs and we can take all of these things to help us to recover, but the, ultimately we want to change our diet and lifestyle patterns and rhythms and the rituals within that to create the deeper balance that will have more sustainability going forward. So, you know, this is what we really want to start looking at when we talk about holistic health, mind, body, spirit, well, what does that mean? It means looking at ourselves holistically and not just what is the issue within us as a disease. So either there is not a disease focused system, it is a person centered system. So we're looking at the whole of you and we are looking at the whole of you and establishing a very personalized approach. So one size does not fit all with Ayurveda. It's very much about individualizing your medicines and your diet and your lifestyle. And how do we do that? Well, we have a system called the doshas and I'm not going to go into the doshas because we'll be here for another hour, but the doshas are our bioenergetic forces within us that help us to establish our dominance. So maybe we have a bit more air or a bit more fire or a bit more earth dominant in our constitution. And when we understand the dominance of our constitution and we look out for the signs and symptoms, we can start to think about our health vulnerabilities. And that's as a practitioner what I look at. I look at the health vulnerabilities and bring those, those balances back into your system. So we are starting to think about the root cause, but also personalizing it. So yes, we've heard of keto and paleo and vegan, and you know, these are all very fleeting approaches to healthcare and you know, somebody benefited from following a keto diet or a paleo diet, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's gonna be the right diet or a lifestyle for me. So I've got to really start understanding who I am as a person. What are my triggers? What makes me happy? What brings me joy? And understand what will bring balance to me. Because in Ayurveda, we're looking at this, the, you know, the principle is like increases like, and the opposites will bring balance. So if I am a Vata person, I have a lot of air quality, maybe I'm susceptible to issues of insomnia or dry skin or sluggish bowel movements. These are all Vata type of symptoms. So if I have a diet and lifestyle that aggravates that, so I have late nights or I eat dry foods or I eat raw cold vegetables, these are, these are the types of things that will aggravate me. But what we want to do to balance is things that are opposite in nature, right? So we're going to be looking at herbs that are balancing that have a more grounding uh, effect. So Anita mentioned uh, with Thania Somnifera, this is ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is a very traditional Ayurvedic herb that can really, because it's a root essentially. So roots, if you think about them, they're grounding for us. 
So we don't have to feel like we've got to get into the technicalities. If we understand a few simple qualities that Vata is cold, light and dry, then we want to make sure that we're having warm, cooked, unctuous foods, things that are grounding and nourishing and warming for us. And then we just need to apply that principle. So, so with the system of Ayurveda, we're really taking a 360 degree approach. And that's going to be uh, looking like what we've got on the slide here. So, you know, are we sleeping and resting well? And this is something that we want to really think about, particularly during the pandemic, but also as we're going into the winter months, because winter is about um, restoration and rejuvenation. So this is a month where we don't want to be doing any kind of detoxing or anything like that. This is about restoration. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So when we talk about stress, when we have increased stress, as Anita mentioned, we get a lot of health issues. And stress is sort of synonymous with low Im immunity. So if we, the, the more stress we have, the lower our immune system will be. So our enthusiasm will, will reduce, maybe we'll have a compromised digestive system, maybe we're gonna lose the luster of our skin, our energy is gonna deplete, and maybe we'll start to see other deeper issues. So we want to start thinking about, you know, using um, this wisdom of how to balance stress, because a little stress, as Anita said, can be beneficial, but when it gets too much, it can be um, really adverse and have those symptoms. So stress, yes, it is believed to be the biggest causative factor of health issues, but so is poor diet, so is lack of exercise, so is unhealthy habits, so are bad, you know, you know, so is alcohol, drugs, all of those recreational things. So we need to start thinking about removing the causative factor and replacing it with things that bring more balance. Okay, so sleep. Sleep and rest is really important because that's when the body restores and rejuvenates overnight. So the timing of our sleep is super important. So 10 o'clock is a new midnight. So we want to go to sleep by midnight, by before midnight. One hour before midnight is equal to two hours after. So it's the quality that has the impact, not that number of hours. So we are falling asleep at a time where the body's energy is a little bit slower and sluggish. And because of that energy being stronger, the depth and the quality of our sleep will be much better. So it is the case of early, early to bed, early to rise um, makes us healthy and wealthy. And that is for sure when it comes to wellness. So diet and nutrition, um, I'm going to talk about that in just a moment, exercise and movement. So all of these factors are going to impact our well-being and we want to address all of them. We want to take a 360 degree approach to our wellness. Okay. So I don't want to get too much into the science of it, but I want to give you some winter wellness tips today that you can take away, that you can immediately apply in your day-to-day -day with whatever resonates with you. So we are at the moment in autumn and we're going into winter. So what does that mean? Well, winter is the time where nature hibernates. Uh, we've had all the trees shed their leaves. And this is the time in autumn where we do our shedding and cleansing and um, releasing of anything that doesn't serve us, both in the physical body, but also mentally and emotionally. And I think this year for most of us during the pandemic has been a very reflective year where we've been forced to go inwards and shed and let go of the things and really face ourselves. We've got nowhere to turn, no distractions, no cinema, no restaurants. We've got nothing to distract us, but we have to go inward. So we want to use this time constructively. And during the winter and autumn months, this is the time to release all of those things and focus on going inwards. So this is the time during the winter period where we want to build our storehouses, where we want to boost our immunity. It's a complete myth that, you know, it, our immunity is weaker in the winter months. This is not true. Our immunity should be strongest during the winter months because we should be having the foods that support our immunity and wellness. 
So we want to think about, you know, eating foods that are warm and cooked. So in Anita's poll, gut health came up, obviously, as, a, as an issue. And we think of salads as being very healthy, but actually in the winter months, and if we have a weak digestive system, salads may be deemed as healthy, but they are not healthy because the gut cannot digest it. So the concern is much more about how you digest food, not only what you're eating. So a bag of raw carrots with hummus could be considered really healthy. But then we have like gas and bloating and we get distension of the abdomen. So why is that when we've eaten only healthy items? Well, it's because it's raw. So if we have a weak digestive system, so our gut is like a fire. And if the fire is on a low heat, then the food that we take in won't digest. So in that case, we want to think about, well, carrot soup, because the fact that it's warm and cooked will be very nourishing and easily easily digested by our, our gut. So then the other thing that is really important, and this is more of a pattern that we can sometimes follow, is that we've been drummed into us that breakfast is the main meal of the day. It's, you must eat breakfast, you mustn't skip breakfast. Well, in Ayurveda, breakfast is not the most important meal of the day. It's actually lunch. Now, why is that? Because we have to think of our body as a mirror of nature. And as the sun is rising, it's just gaining its heat. Now, as it gains heat, we wouldn't necessarily go sunbathing or expose ourselves to that sun um, for, for that, that benefit. We're only just gaining our energy. Well, our digestive system mirrors this. And so when we are waking up in the morning, the, the, the fires in our digestive system are only just awakening. So to put a heavy meal in the gut or in the stomach at that time might not be the best thing for all of us. So really, we want to go on the notion that we only want to eat when we are hungry. And that's a massive question for us to answer because we eat very habitually. But we really want to ask ourselves is, am I feeling hunger? If the answer is yes, by all means, have a meal. If we're not, then we must wait for hunger to arise. Because if we eat without hunger being present, the digestive system won't break that food down. And that healthy food even sometimes can turn toxic in the system. So that's the difference between knowing what's right for your body and what we've been drummed into us as being healthy. So in Ayurveda, we say lunch is the main meal of the day because the, because the sun gets to the highest point at that time and it's, it's at its strongest. So our digestive fire is also at its strongest. So also thinking about food, we want to think about obviously portion control and eating consciously because, our, you know, when we talk about stress and gut, well, if we are stressed and we're eating, it's going to Im 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 impact our digestion. If we are distracted, our mental, mental attention is elsewhere on the phones or on the computer or in a, in a deep conversation, our engagement mentally is not on the food. So this, this, communication between the gut and the brain can really break down. So eating consciously with all of our sensory organs is really, really important. So we already talked about going to bed early, but we can adopt some really beautiful bedtime rituals before we go to bed to help us to sleep better. So maybe we wanna have a nice spiced milk with nutmeg and cardamom, which are wonderful semi-sedative spices. Maybe we can give ourselves a foot massage, which can also help us to sleep. And obviously going to bed early without um, being distracted with devices. And then we want to think about invigorating the body in the morning. So the morning is about cleansing and invigoration, getting a little bit of exposure, exercising. We, we always forget how important exercise is in reducing stress. So we don't need to pound it at the gym, but we really just need to get some exposure and movement in the morning to get that lymphatic system moving again. So we wanna think about all the gentle issues there. So just to finish off, I just wanna just give you a few quick pointers about some quick, um, simple self-care tips that we 
um, talk a lot about in Ayurveda and we can go into a lot of detail but here are just a few which you'll be able to refer back to at a later date so we want to start taking care of our sensory organs so in Ayurveda health isn't just diet it isn't just one faculty it's about looking after our sensory organs making sure that our elimination is good through bowels through urine making sure that we have a strong digestive fire making sure our body tissues are well nourished so our senses are really important and in the mornings we will do a lot of cleansing rituals so scraping the tongue or cleansing the nasal passage with a neti pot so these are all rituals that we have in our morning routine to take care of our sensory organs breathing exercises which is absolutely wonderful and for me the biggest connection between the mind and the body so engaging in breathing exercises and we call them pranayama prana is the life force energy within us and we can access and channel that life force within us through the power of breath so you know even if you haven't got any yogic training in breathing practices which i can help you with um, just normal, deep, long breathing can be very, very powerful. So definitely movement um, exercise is magical in the morning. We want to make sure we get lots of fresh air in the morning. We want to start thinking about, you know, staying hydrated um, rather than caffeinating our body. So caffeine in small amounts can be beneficial, but if we already have stress, then I would not recommend it. In that case, we want to have plenty of herbal teas and stay away from the caffeine. We want to wake up and have an attitude of gratitude because it's amazing when you start looking at the small things in life and appreciate those little things, those big worries that we self, um, you know, self manifest half the time are no longer there because we can appreciate what is really in front of us. So we want to start thinking about maybe writing a journal with a few um three or four points every day morning or evening or things that you're grateful for and reflect on those because sometimes and some days you might have to dig really deep for those because you can't think of anything good in your day but that i can assure you there will be something that you can find to bring that balance um alongside breathing we've got meditation so there are lots of meditation practices but if you're new to meditation and you find it a struggle, don't worry. Sometimes it could look like a nice stroll in the park with a good playlist. Just keep it really simple. All we're doing through the practice of meditation is becoming still, just slowing down, becoming still, becoming aware of your body, becoming aware of your triggers and just being really, really present and cultivating that. So the, the only other thing I want to mention, uh, because we are running out of time, is the notion of, you know, as humans, we are social beings, but we are being forced to um, be distant from our loved ones at this time. So, like I said at the beginning, you know, we can use this time constructively to enhance ourselves, to become more acquainted with ourselves as a best friend. So let's start thinking about how we balance our social time and our solo time. What is it that we can do to enhance and nurture our relationships so they are more fruitful and supportive for us? And what can we do in our alone time that can also benefit us? There's a big difference between being lonely and having aloneness. So there's a big difference. We want to be content with our aloneness, but not feel lonely. So that can also be a really big um, aspect of what can trigger stress for us. So I'm practicing in London and you're welcome to connect with me. Um, my social media handles are there on that last slide. I do run workshops periodically um, and seasonally to help people with various issues, stress, gut health, immunity, um, so on and so forth, many different topics. And I do run retreats online as well. So please do feel free to connect with me at any point. I'd be more than happy to support you on your wellness journey. And thank you very much for your time today.
I'll hand back over to Barbara. Thank you, Geeta. Thank you, Anita. That was um, really good. I recognize um, a lot of the things that I'm maybe not doing that I should. <laughs> but actually, it was um, a really good uh, reconnection for me with some of the things that I used to do and find re found really uh, useful, like keeping a journal. The gratitude journal is a good one. Um, so it certainly um, reminded me of that, something I've stopped. Mm -hmm. um, so just check here for um, any Q and A's, any any questions. So I've I've got a quick question. Um, so I think in both of your um, talks you mentioned about um, morning seems to be a um, and bedtime seem to be big triggers for stress. Um, if I'm a night owl, which I am, am I pre predisposed to stress because I go to bed late and don't like getting up early in the morning? Is that a habit I should break? Because what about my, um, you know, is that, or is that just the way I am and I should accept that? Yeah, sure, Barbara, I'm, I'm happy to share my opinion on that. So uh, see, see, the thing is our body works on circadian rhythms. Okay, and according to Ayurveda, so we have the doshas, so they not only govern our um, body, but it governs the time of day, it governs the season. So we are literally a mirror of what's going on in nature. So we've become, we've become stuck in this man-made uh, concept of time, right? And this is what we should do at certain times, nine to five job. And, you know, we have late nights, but actually our body works on the circadian rhythm. So the earlier we go to bed, the deeper the sleep will be, but we do need to train the body to get to that point where we can sleep earlier because the energy of that time will support certain activities. So if we go to bed a little later, 11, 12 o'clock, the body literally wakes up because the energy of fire and pitta and activity and productivity kicks in. So you might be feeling drowsy around nine, 10 o'clock, but maybe you push through and then now you're alert and awake and now you can't sleep even if you wanted to sleep. So that's where we start working against the natural energies that the body's used to. So historically, you know, the ancestors would have worked with the sun energy and the moon energy. So with the sun, we'd wake up with sunrise and that's when we do all the cleansing and invigorating and then we want to start unwinding which is exactly what Anita was talking about with the cortisol level it's you know the body's designed to follow a certain pattern but we're constantly going against it and that is what's triggering a lot of our issues long term okay thank you um so we have a, a few questions come in here um i have poor digestion what should i avoid and can bad gut make your acne worse? I'm just combining two there to try and um, get the time in. Yeah. yeah. Look, I mean, in terms of gut health, it's kind of a bit of a multifactorial issue. So obviously stress is a contributory factor to inflamed gut and, you know, poor absorption of nutrients and bloating and digestive issues. Hormonal issues. Some women just before their period, they can get some gut issues because uh, progesterone can be a bit of an inflammatory hormone uh, obviously with the food that you're eating if you're intolerant to some things and you know there are people with you know wheat intolerances that periodically can't help themselves and have bread and then they're causing inflammation so you know i can't really address that issue specifically um i forgot the second part of the question uh, can bad gut make your acne worse yeah it can i mean um if you're not absorbing things properly and you're not excreting things properly in that kind of digestive process then the only other outlet for your body to excrete is the skin yeah so that that can be an issue but obviously you know skin can relate to hormonal issues as well um so again skin is multi a uh, multifactorial which is why it's such a problem you know people with skin issues have got like cupboards full of creams and potions you know you need to kind of address insulin resistance can cause skin problems as well you know it's so it's better best to see people like myself and Gita that 
know how to treat people as individuals and then we get down to the root cause of your skin and gut issues yeah okay um i have another one here uh somebody can't live without caffeine uh how can i wake up without coffee and lol and uh, any tips to reduce the uh, coffee intake good question i think a lot of people can relate to that I'm just going to jump in quickly, but I do want to give Geeta time to answer this. Just tell you of my experience, yeah? So I used to work in banking, and back in 2000, and, you know, 2000 to 2003, I was very senior in banking. I was managing multiple projects. I had a team of people, and they were grooming me for the board of the bank, yeah? And I was drinking nine espressos a day. Yeah? So I was coming home and using wine to calm me down. from <laughs> the espressos, yeah? Now I have one coffee yeah, in the morning and I function very well. So doing you know, my degree in naturopathy, understanding how caffeine actually affects the body, adrenaline, cortisol, all that malarkey. Once, you have, once you've been educated, then you go, do you know what? I'm not going to drink four or five coffees. I'll have the one that I really need in the morning. And after that, I can actually function without it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with, with that, Anita. I think, yeah, it's, it's about discipline and limiting. So one coffee a day is, is perfectly fine. In fact, you know, sometimes we need to change the way in which we consume things. So if we're using it as a stimulant to wake us up, this is not the right way to use coffee. But coffee can be, one cup of coffee can be beneficial to our digestion, actually. So we want to think about, you know, alternatives. So in Ayurveda, we focus a lot on herbal teas. Um, spiced, you know, we can use spices. Um, there's, there's some really nice products called barley cup and chicory root um, drinks out there, which can be a nice alternative. But the first thing is just to start reducing it. Um, you know, people say, well, green tea also has caffeine in it, so I should stop green tea. But green tea also has a lot of antioxidant properties in there as well. So it's really balanced in that way. So you can have very small amounts of caffeine. There is nothing on this planet that is going to be bad for us. It's the way in which we are using it, which is bad. So if we have, a if we have too much of any substance, it's going to um, create an issue in our body. So a little of everything creates diversity and balance. So I don't think it's a matter of stopping coffee. I think it's a matter of just understanding your body and the impact of coffee on you so we need to start thinking about how coffee works for you as an individual rather than say oh you know coffee is bad give it a bad name say oh i can't drink coffee and it, it's really bad for you it's not bad for you it's just it might be bad for you based on how you consume it or based on what health issues you are having okay thank you and um i think room for maybe just one more just on the hour um how would how do we source licorice or um redolia um sorry i'm probably saying that wrong um from what form does it come yeah so herbs come in multiple sorts of forms so you can get dried form you can get liquid form you can get tablet form um so yeah i mean you know as a naturopath i've got a dispensary with big massive bottles of the liquid herb because that's more closer to its natural state and it's easily assimilated by the body so I would you know advise a liquid form but I just want to kind of let everyone know in all the herbs that I've recommended I, I've been recommending them from an education point of view mentioned in clinical trials I'm not saying go out there and purchase it because in the same way you can't go and buy an antibiotic or an antidepressant from boots you know um, us naturopaths and Ayurvedic practitioners you know we don't want people just self-medicating randomly because you know we've done the degrees to understand what herbs are right for you and it's an individualized practice but in answer to the questions i generally dispense liquid herbs but i do have tablet herbs but i'd go for a liquid form that's more natural and easier to digest okay so um thank you thank you both very much um you can see that there's interest in your topic um you know by the questions we haven't quite got time for them all, but we'll, um, I've taken note of the ones that we can't answer and we can um, head over to the forum and see if we can get some quick answers to, um, you know, five minutes maybe on the forum. So uh, Gita and Anita, thank you so much for your time today. And for everybody who joined us, thank you for joining us. Have thanks a good rest of your day. Thanks Barbara and thanks thank Gita. And have a lovely weekend, everybody.